1945, Thelma McCollum, ladies, patented the first stereoscopic television apparatus. 1951, Ray Bradbury's short story, The Velt, describes two children who prefer their simulated reality nursery to their own parents. 1955, the first heads-up display concepts being worked on by the US Naval Research and Development Labs. There was already various mechanical reflective systems already in use during World War II. 1959, Philip K. Dick, the story, Time Out of Joint, Regal Gum is trapped within an artificial reality that resembles small town America in the late 50s. Turns out to be some kind of government simulation. 1957, Morton Heilig, interested in 3D movies, patents a stereoscopic television head-mounted display for individual use, hoping to realize the cinema of the future. He called it a telesphere mask. We'll be returning to Heilig in just a moment. 1961, the Philco head sight. This is telepresence. You're actually viewing the image from a camera in the room next over. The base of the device includes some sort of movement system. I didn't have time to research how it works, I'm afraid. Morton Heilig again, 1962, the Sensorama. It's analog, stereoscopic vision, low interactivity, but had some cool gimmicks like the seat moves around. It had wind effects and smell effects. Nice. 1965, the General Electric's Hardiman exoskeleton. Lovely piece of machinery. This sort of binds into what we're talking about because we're interested in haptic feedbacks, force feedbacks, that kind of thing. Very Warhammer 40K. It's so cool. 19... Whoa, Grope. 1967, the first known force feedback project by Fred Brooks. Very clumsy, that's Grope 1, that's Grope 3, that's where they're doing messing around some sort of simulation with molecular bindings. 1968, The Sword of Damocles by Ivan Sutherland. He called this a boom display, binocular omni-orientation monitor. This is the first device that really fulfills what we're talking about here. It has a computer-generated view. It projects a simple wireframe room. The Damocles was pretty impressive. It tracked the position of both eyes, allowed the user to swivel it around the z-axis 360 degrees, tracked orientation and the head position of the user. But it had a transparent view. So some people could say it's augmented reality. Some say it's virtual reality. Go figure, I don't really care that much about that. By 1970, he had this fully functional head-mounted display. 1971, Stanislav Lem writes the book Futurological Congress, where in the year 2098, the world has nearly 100 billion population. The government feeds them a cocktail of hallucinogens that keeps the citizens in a sort of layered, onion-like illusion of well-being to facilitate their survival in a grim and sardine-packed reality. Matrix probably ripped that off quite a bit. 1972, General Electric makes the first flight simulator with three screens and a 180-degree field of view. I'm afraid I could have only find this small image. By 1975, modern heads-up displays used in airplane approaches to landing were developed. Rudimentary helmet-mounted sights were used in fixed-wing aircraft for targeting air-to-air -air missiles. 1976, Utah University, James H. Clark came out with a paper called Designing Surfaces in 3D, which called for a head-mounted display and a three-dimensional wand control device. First reference I've found of that. 1977, Sandin and Sayre invent a bend-sensing glove. 1977, Star Wars popularizes the targeting computer. These are actually really bad for human vision. Pilots spend two years, in general, at least, getting used to it. They cause the eyes to fight for dominance. This causes headaches, double vision, blurred vision, disorientation, after images, nasty stuff. 1979, the Aspen movie map. It's basically Google Street View using LaserDisc technology. The idea was that a rescue team could mm, practice navigating around a location without actually visiting it. 
1979, Paul Hemus tracking system. These guys are still in business today, 40 years later. It's the tracking device that's used almost ubiquitously for head tracking, hand tracking, and also motion capture, that sort of thing. These days, there are multiple systems for position tracking, including magnetic, mechanical, optical, acoustic, inertia, and neural. They all have their pros and cons. Time doesn't allow for me to go any deeper into that. 1979, the McDonnell Douglas Vital Helmet. 1977, the visually coupled airborne systems simulator by Thomas Furness III. This photo actually may be from the 80s, but what a beast. Head aimed control, voice activated control, touch sensitive panel, virtual hand controller in a volume or region within the cockpit, windowed into the visual display. You could make adjustments, place fingers over virtual buttons, had auditory, visual, tactile feedback, 3D surround sound. Amazing stuff. I'm afraid I could find only the mock-up of the display, but not the actual readout. I imagine it didn't look quite so nice. Furness, in 1989, became the director of the Human Interface Technology Lab at the University of Washington, which became one of the centers of growth in virtual reality. 1980, Steve Mann, the iTap. This guy is considered the father of wearable computing. He's been wearing these devices for, what is it now, 35 years, and he also reports a lot of problems inherent. Again, the before mentioned headaches, after images, even after using the device, you can have hours, even days, with weird artifacts happening. It remains to be seen how these Oculus Rifts will affect long-time users. 1982, Tron the movie, Human in the Computer, classic. 1983, Schman, the drawing device. 1983, again, Videodrome, the movie by David Cronenberg, long live the new flesh. Quote, TV screens are the retina of the mind's eye being part of the brain, and videodrome transmissions create a brain tumor in the viewer, changing the reality through video hallucination. Highly recommended viewing. 1984, Neuromancer, the book by William Gibson. <clears throat> Neuromancer envisioned a world where corporations are hijacked by dudes in capsule hotels with cyber decks. The Ono Sendai Cyber C7 jacked directly into your brain. Full wraparound mirror shade implants. He had this vision of what this cyberspace was, which actually reflects pretty well the previous speech of this geometry. A consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation. A graphic representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer in the human system. Unthinkable complexity. Lines of light ranged in the non-space of the mind. Clusters and constellations of data, like city lights receding. The word cyberspace really is so loose that nowadays it is said to have 28 different meanings, one of which just is a metaphor for the internet. And similarly, cybersex has become diluted to just meaning pornographic camp performances online, illegal in the Philippines now. Uh, whoop, just back a bit, the concept of this direct neural interface is massively interesting. I would love to talk for another hour about that. Time does not allow. It's basically what represents the hardcore end of the spectrum of the vision of what virtual reality should become in the future. And it's quite possible. 1984, the leap, the large, oh shit, I went excuse my language, the large expanse extra perspective panoramic stereo photography system forms the base for the wide angle stereo window. Up to this point you always had a limited stereo window and you had all sort of artifacts, distortion and the edges and this guy figured out the lenses, how to make it fully encompass your field of view and it's all sharp and nice. It's a selfie showing for the inventor Eric Howlett 1985, NASA Vivid Virtual Environment. This was the first cheap VR set for around $2,000. Later changed to the Virtual Interface Environment Workstation. The NASA Data Glove. Brutally uncomfortable looking and clumsy. 1985, Jaron Lanier. 
He popularized the term virtual reality and was working with NASA on these goggles and gloves projects. He was a pretty spacey guy. He was thinking all this stuff that all you can do is be creative in virtual reality. Give or take. It would free the imagination of the masses, help people to communicate and bring a new kind of spiritual understanding. The VPL data glove cost $8,500. 1988, the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme had the first commercially produced automobile with a head-mounted head-up display, excuse me. 1989, the first commercial head-mounted display, rather unfortunately named Cyberface. It's by the same guy, Howlett, who made the leap before the leap was used in most of the systems during this time. 1989, Autodesk used Timothy Leary, the LSD prophet, in an early promotional film. This sparked articles with names like Electronic LSD, the Cyberdelic Experience. This may not have been a good move in retrospect, as the links between 60s drug culture and virtual reality in the 90s were alienating to the general public. It seemed like VR attracted the attentions of self-styled cyberpunks and hackers. It was viewed as self-indulgent, hedonistic. Stories started appearing in the mainstream press warning of the dangers of addiction to VR experience, troubled by the potential psychic damage VR might cause. Now, the actual danger of addiction to VR at this point had absolutely no clinical basis. The technology barely existed. But rest assured, now that the new boom is coming, we will have plenty more of that. 1989, the power glove. The first attempt to bring it to the masses. What a horrible, horrible flop. 100,000 units sold, but it had no actual VR display involved. A handful of games, it flopped. Bad start, bad start. 1990, the first Battletech Center opened in Chicago. Half a dozen or so of these highly specialized entertainment simulator facilities are still operational today. This sort of marks the 90s boom. I mean, it started becoming popularized in the 80s, and suddenly it appeared in children's books, dance parties, TV print, news stories, magazine articles, game shows, documentaries, VR parks, virtual adventures, and Again, a horrible, horrible naming, Voomies. No, 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 no. 1991, Virtuality, powered by the Amiga 3000, had nine games. Now, this was the first system that really started to be successful. It was broadly marketed, consumer-oriented. It was network pods for multiplayer gaming, and it sort of seemed pretty nice, and the marketing images promised so you could go scuba diving with this sucker, and the reality, of course, was fairly crude. It's a blurry screenshot, but you get the idea. 1991, the virtual research flight helmet, again, leap optics. 1992, lawnmower man, what a classic. You get that tight spandex suit on, you suspend yourself in a ring, you're getting electric shocks from some steamy remote partner in the Cybersex SM. Iconic movie, I've failed to find the origin of this full-body rotation setup. I'd love to know if somebody knows about it. Please tell me more. Okay, the cave, computer-assisted virtual environment. You're standing inside the box, projectors. They're still being used today, actually. It's an easy system to get into since you don't need all this gear. You're just standing inside. 1994, the desk. Again, I would love to play with one of those. It looks nice. 1994, Project Elysium from the same guys who made Virtuality. This was used in architectural and construction applications. 1995, The Virtual Boy. I'll take a bit more longer with this again. Second attempt to get this show on the road for the masses. From the legendary inventor of the Game & Watch and the Game Boy, Gunpei Yokoi. Monochrome red stereo display, parallax depth illusion. It was cool, it had a strong marketing campaign, didn't sell well, wasn't really that immersive, bad ergonomics, you had to like hunch over, keep your face still. Uh, Monocolor, lack of head tracking, it was clear this toy isn't really virtual at all, but interesting point, they had a new controller for it to facilitate Z movement, which resembled the controllers of today with two D-pads for both thumbs. 1995, the Holosketch. 
These guys got an interesting circular GUI layout going on there, and they abandoned the power glove completely for a custom controller because the hand rotation is so limited. They wanted to be able to really get that fast, fast selection thing going. And the current definition of VR is demanding realistic interface, and that's outdated rubbish. It's whatever interface tools suit the job are fine. 1996, Ghost in the Shell, the movie. And the comic visualizes a lot of both augmented reality and virtual reality, also AI technology. Masamune Shiro, the comic artist from Japan, also famous for Appleseed. Lots of very interesting visions of future tech design, well worth checking out. 1997, the 3D IVS, three-dimensional immersive virtual sculpting, introduces the user interface. So I don't actually have a picture of it, but they had it as a wearable wristwatch type interface that you carry around in the scene. Groundbreaking stuff. 1998, $300, Scuba from Philips. 1998, the Other Zone movie shows the bad guy with an AR monocle. He's accessing all the cameras in the city with it. 1999, The Matrix, we all know that. 2000 to 2008, the EV virtual environment at Helsinki University of Technology started playing around with stuff and uh, all this pre-drawing, cave paint, hell of mile, everybody's starting to mess around. You've got both gloves, you're designing prototypes in 3D. The precision was still quite low, so you couldn't really do very nice stuff, but you could make rough prototypes quite well. This is an interesting one, the Step Wim, hands-free multi-scale navigation. So it's a rough pick again, but this image shows that uh, he's in a gallery and that's the architectural plan under his feet. And with these fancy footwear, you could like tow the floor and move large distances in the cave type environment. Probably a dead end, who knows. 2002, a pop-through button device. I think this is very nice. They've got the finger sleeve. Tri-state button, two clearly di distinguished activation states, pressing lightly or firmly on the button surface. Also, it had a pointer. And this is a nice small design. You think th these rings are coming out now. They're not new. This is basically the same thing. I think this should work really well with like low-end introductory level VR or AR. 2002, virtual reality exposure therapy for the World Trade Center post-traumatic stress disorder victims. So the sort of therapy thing has been experimented before, but this really brought it out into the limelight. So you're getting desensitized to the trauma by reliving the event. These are used quite fairly often these days, if you have the money for it, I suppose, for various traumas, phobias, if you're scared of spiders, you hang around with spiders. Snow World, that was for burn victims. So this cold and chill virtual environment made it easier to dampen the pain when you're changing the bandages of burn victims. 2003, Second Life, it's not VR, it's a metaverse. You're like a completely separate world. They're now making a reincarnation for Oculus Rift. Damn, time goes fast. The Haptic Cow by Sarah Bailey, first used in farm animal teaching in Glasgow, now used in several vet schools. Helma, the drawing from Finland, Tekoko, Pluto, Wolf. 2004, virtual air guitar, very smooth. These guys are still making similar experimental control systems for video games like Kung Fu High Impact. A similar interface called the Mimu we recently failed a Kickstarter. 2005, the Virtus Spear. Uh, apparently, the problem is it takes a second to stop. One in ten users stumble when they use it. No hospitalization so far as I know. 2006, the Toshiba helmet. You can see Toshiba, they make TVs. The design obviously influenced by that. 2007, Six Sense True Motion, now making the STEM system. 2008, HoodieDD, the high-end wearable display device. It's a cool $80,000. Not for everybody. 
And I'm going to skip for the last five years to the only really interesting thing I've seen that's making something different. Everything else is just iterating. The tactical haptics controller simulates the feel of actually something twisting in your hand. So when you're swinging a sword around, these four little black sliders are sliding around, and you feel like something's really happening there. So, like I said, I had to skip a lot of cool stuff to make this fit. I would love to go on about the advances, especially in neural interfacing, cyborg, or cyborg stuff, the implications of that. To keep it short, I'll say that I believe sticking tightly to, to the preconceptions of what is VR and AR is, in my mind, counterproductive. That, In my mind, the optimal situation is that you could be able to slide seamlessly from AR to VR back and one of the only things at the moment that's sort of giving that promise to me is Castar. I'm very interested in that. You just flip, um, you know, it's AR, and you put an extra lens on, and it becomes VR. Fast moves, fast moves. I guess we have time for a short question or two, if anybody's up for it. Uh, microphone coming your way. <coughs> Yes, yeah, so um, I read online about this. People are starting to get the <coughs> Oculus Rift development kits. And uh, uh, you talked about these uh, early systems with uh, after images. And I've heard reports of people saying that, like, yeah, I wore the uh, VR helmet. And now I have these kind of uh, uh, strange sensations, like, uh, uh, I guess, kind of confusing. Uh, reality and virtual reality. Are, are you worried about this kind of thing going forward? I would take it very seriously. Prolonged usage of these devices will undoubtedly cause some after effects, possibly distress for major majority of users. I recommend investigating the guy Steve Mann I mentioned before. He has written a lot of articles about this. Three, two, one, last call. I'll show a screenshot from my upcoming game later this year. Thank you.